Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Retro Wrestling with Gene Jackson. I'm your host, Gene Jackson, and today we are going to be doing another one of our reviews. And to do that, I'm going to be joined by my co-host for the day, Broadcast Bob Anderson. Bob, how you doing, man? Doing pretty good, Gene. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Uh, you know, I, I this this show is kind of a little bit of everything. We do interviews on here. We do um, watch alongs, and 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 we started doing some reviews on here. I recently did one with Tyler Peters where we looked at Smoky Mountain Wrestling's uh, Bluegrass Brawl from 1993. And uh, I talked to you about uh, doing some of these and uh, I handed it over to you and I said, Hey man, pick, pick whatever you want, pick a show for us to review. So tell us what you chose and a little bit about why you chose it. Well, I chose anything except for the UWF Fury Hour, because if anybody has seen those things, I'm never yeah. watching one of those again. Um, hurts my soul. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I actually went back to... 1991 for the Global Wrestling Federation. Um, I know it's not the best wrestling we're ever going to watch on here, but I have fond memories. Um, I don't know. I'd have been 10, 11. I, I don't want to do math right now, but I actually remember going home every day from school, get to my grandma's house right at four o'clock on ESPN. This show would be starting. And that was back in the time before we had these territorial wrestling wars that we have today where you can only apparently watch one show and you have to fight about it on Twitter or whatever. But all I cared about was wrestling was on. I didn't give a, can we swear on here, Gene? Oh, you can say anything you want. Okay. I didn't give a shit what it was. As long as it was wrestling, I was watching it. You know, I mean, there were six WCW shows on the weekend, three or four WWF shows. And then global was on every day at four o'clock. And I was just so excited. Like I ran home from school every day to get to watch this show. And, like looking back on it all these years later, it's not the best show in the world, but I picked this particular episode because it's got a Buddy Landell, gorgeous Gary Young match that I think is absolutely phenomenal, Hell not yeah. for the wrestling prowess, but just because it's one of the master class of healing that you'll ever see. Um, so yeah, that's why I picked GWF to start with. I like it. Um, you know, I it's great that, you know, we're in the same age bracket, more or less. And that's how like, you're older. I kid, I'm older. Let's, let's be honest. I'm a little older, but, uh, you know, when we were kids, I just, if it was wrestling and I knew about it, I was watching it. And if there was a magazine and I could get my hands on, it, I was reading it. And I didn't, I don't know. Like to me, I didn't really, uh, differentiate good wrestling, bad wrestling. Like if it's wrestling and, and it's on, let's watch it. And, 100%. Uh, you know, I remember very fondly remember global and, and, you know, that's something, you know, as I've gotten older and did tape trading and all this different stuff and I've gone back and watched stuff and I'm like, man, that, that I remember that being a lot better than this, you know, and even, uh, like on a recent Patreon, me and, uh, Brian Trammell was looking back at some world class and I told him, I said, you know, I remember world class being just awesome, but I said the more I watch of it as an adult, the psychology was very lacking in world class. Even in the heyday, there's some of the stuff that you know with conventional wrestling knowledge, you kind of scratch your head and go, "Man, that really doesn't play along with what I've learned over the years from the Jim Cornettes and the different people." And so uh, it's fun to go back and look at this. And I'm glad you picked picked Global. And honestly. You know, we did that UWF series, but me and you had kicked around the idea at different times of, uh, of you know, doing global. And I, I don't know if there's enough there to, to do a weekly global show. But as we go along here on Retro Wrestling and we do these reviews as you're available, uh, we're going to look at a lot of different stuff. But we'll probably circle back to another global show. But to kind of give people a little bit of context, uh, if you don't know, if you're a younger person or didn't have ESPN in your area at the time. I don't know who that who, who on earth that would be if you just flat out didn't have cable, I guess. But the Global Wrestling Federation came along. I mentioned World Class. So when World Class uh, gave way to the USWA, Jerry Jarrett bought into the company and they really just couldn't get Dallas back up off its ass and basically sold out, went back to Memphis to what they were what they were used to. Uh, it kind of created an opportunity there in Dallas at the Sportatorium where wrestling had been going on for years and years and years. And so Joe Petticino, who is most widely known 
or having his wrestling pro wrestling block in Atlanta where he put six hours of wrestling on TV every, every week he had shows from all across the country and he had his uh, pro wrestling this week where there was clips of everything from Portland continental, the UWF, even the WWF put stuff on there. It was, it was pretty amazing. Him and at one point it was him and Gordon solely posting it together. And other times it was him and his wife, Bonnie Blackstone, how did you score her? Um, that's one of the age-old questions in wrestling. Um, Burt Prentice gave a little insight into, the, into that in his book. We may talk about that another time. Uh, anyhow, so when Global came about, they basically presented the Global Wrestling Federation as if it was just that. It was a global wrestling company that had been putting on wrestling. It, it has wrestling matches going on all over the world, champions and every country and continent you could think of. And now for some reason they have decided to come to Dallas, Texas. <laughs> um, there's also, I think this was even presented amongst the boys, the, the, the wrestlers that there was like this Nigerian, even before, before this was an email scam, some <laughs> Nigerian, Nigerian royalty was, was giving uh, Joe Pettacino $10 million or something to, to start this thing. <laughs> Maybe that's where uh, that originated, Gene. I, I could be, it could be, uh, but you know, from what I've, what I've studied and found out. And like I say, I referenced Burt Prentice's book a lot on my podcast, you know, Burt was around during this time and at the, the launch of the GWF and most people who have knowledge say the GWF was actually backed by a family with the name of Overstreet is a guy who was a, Big professional wrestling fan. He owned a huge landscaping business in Atlanta, and he knew Joe Petticino. His mother was rich. She's the one that helped start the landscaping business. And they put some money into the GWF, which was Joe Petticino and his wife, Bonnie Blackstone, a wrestler slash booker, Bill Eady, and then the television syndicator who was left over from the USWA, Max Andrews. So they start global. They go to Dallas, Texas. They put a fresh coat of paint on the sportatorium. And suddenly the sportatorium Literally. becomes the global dome. And as Bob mentioned, what was really unique about it is they put on daily shows on ESPN. So prior to that, you had reruns of old world class that was on either day. And you also had old episodes of the AWA. But this was going to be global, providing content, enough content to put out a show every day of the week in real time, which even by WWE standards today was just absolutely insane to even think of. Uh, but they were uh, they were on ESPN and they had a few different syndication deals throughout the country. Um, and so they, they kicked off in 1991. And it seemed like a really huge deal. I remember as a kid, I'm like, wow, what is it? What's, you know, because it took me a little while, even as, as a kid, to figure out the Global Dome was the, the freaking sportatorium. It, I got there quicker than some, I guess. But, you know, the GWF featured a good mix of like, you had local Texas talent like Brian Adias, The Simpsons, Gary Young, John Tatum. And then you had nationally known guys that were, you know, between promotions Sweet Stan Lane, Norman the Lunatic, Bad News Brown, Cactus Jack. But then you had in this good mix of new stars like the Patriot and Chaz and the Lightning Kid and the Handsome Stranger. <laughs> uh, so uh, before we move past that, uh, tell me a little bit about your initial uh, thoughts, you know, when you first started watching Global and and the, the list of names that people I mentioned, maybe something I haven't gotten around to yet. Uh, first, I did want to say, if people see me chewing on something or drinking a lot, I have a bad cough right now, so I'm trying to get through this, so I apologize for those things. Um, they did do a good job covering up the fact that it just was the old Dallas Sportatorium, like you said, new coat of paint. They built a little stage for interviews. Um, yeah, eventually, you know, if when you saw the aisleways, you saw the seating, you you did figure it out. Um <laughs> Let's see, other names you forgot. You had uh, Scotty the Body there, or at the time, I think it was Scott Anthony, wasn't it? Scott Anthony. So, yes, Raven was there. Um, yeah, you know, Handsome Stranger, Marcus Bagwell, who uh, was very over with the ladies, that's for sure. 
Uh, the Patriot got his start there. Well, I mean, he had been the trooper in AWA, but they put the mask on him. But we'll talk about him more later. Uh, Eddie Gilbert showed up. Uh, Doug Gilbert showed up. And there was just a lot of talent that came through there for this promotion. And like I said, yeah, no, I, I, I like I said, I was watching it every day when it started. Because like you said, there had been the reruns of World Class, AWA. Heck, I think they even showed Glow on Fridays on ESPN. Yeah. I mean, about every day it was something different or every other day. And then, yeah, all of a sudden, all of that stopped and Global came on and they did a very good job hyping it up as something new, a big deal, something worldwide or global. I mean, for lack of a better term, they made it seem far more important than it actually was. And that is definitely one piece of credit I have to give them is especially, you know, I mean, now as a 46 year old, like looking at it going, that's dumb, but. You know, for an 11-year-old, you were like, holy crap, this oh, yeah. is just as big as the WWF. Like, So that was, at the time, you know, it made it seem like, you know, oh, wow, there's a third wrestling promotion that's just as important. So, like, to me, that was my initial, at least remembering now what I thought back then, like, that was my initial, like, experience with it. Like, wow, this is this is new and exciting and just as important as what I've been watching on, you know, Monday nights or Saturday nights and yeah, because the most fun thing to me was it felt like you didn't know who was going to show up on their next. Like these t- championship tournaments, there were all kinds of people. And like I say, it ran the gamut of like guys we had seen in Texas before, but then guys we had seen in the WWF, WCW, some in front, some from Japan, some from Independence. I had only read about in magazines like The Lightning Kid and Jerry Lynn and people like that. <coughs> um, you know, Axel Rotten and some of these guys. So. And then there was guys I recognized from Continental, like Adrian Street. And so uh, every day that I came home and, and ran from the school bus, like you described, I was like, who's it going to be today? And then all of a sudden there's Demolition Axe, and they're calling Axis the Demolisher. I'm like, oh, wow, well, that's weird. My uh, favorite questionable decision of all time, putting Hollywood John Tatum in the light heavyweight title tournament. <laughs> and I love me some John Tatum. I'm just, oh, yeah, the, but... just making fun of the decision. Because, you know, John Tatum a few years before in Mid-South, he might could have passed for the light heavyweight title tournament. John Tatum in 91 <laughs> right. in Global? No, that's not. <laughs> Minim- minimum 245. <laughs> minimum. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in the beginning, they teased this big heel faction known as the Cartel, mm. led by someone known only as the Boss. <laughs> and uh, we'll wait and for a future episode. Exactly. It wasn't. Wasn't Ray Trailer, Andre the Giant, or Bruce Springsteen? But we'll uh, <laughs> we'll save that for a future episode. But let's just the only bit of a hint we'll give is let's just say even though they get the most degree for it, Eric Bischoff and Vince McMahon were not the first people to try to be the heel uh, owner, boss, what have you. But we'll get to that <laughs> in the future. So let's go right now. We're July the tenth, nineteen ninety one for. GWF Supercard, and so we're about a month in. They they debuted in June. Yep. I actually first, did the uh, research. This was taped June twenty eighth, nineteen ninety one. Aired July tenth. And our hosts are Craig Johnson and Scott Hudson. This is not a flattering picture of Scott right there with the face he's making. Scott already somehow looks older here than he did in WCW in ninety eight. Exactly. I'm not sure. And Craig. He was not the announcer here that no. he would go on to be. And I forgot how bad I like I sent you a message watching this. I was like, dude, I'm uh Craig Johnson and Scott Hudson's got me missing freaking Herb Abrams and Bruno San Martino. Like I don't know if I go quite that far, but it was pretty bad. I don't know, man. It, it, some of these clips, you wait until you hear some of the corny stuff that can you pop that we, picture back up there? Yeah, absolutely. Is it me or should Craig Johnson be managing a radio shack instead of calling wrestling? Craig Johnson looks like he should be managing a radio shack and Scott Hudson looks like he should be going, mm-hmm, I reckon. <laughs> yep. Yeah. The dang man I'm talking about, man, I'm going to boom hammer me. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't got no gas in it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, he's liable to kill somebody with a sling blade at any moment <laughs> here by the looks of that picture. Um, so, you know, when the show opens, Craig and Scott let us know what to expect on today's card. Including Rasta the Voodoo Mon, ah, who Scott Hudson had an interesting uh, line here about he wouldn't know 
Wait a minute, Scott. Say that again. You wouldn't know Rasta if he what? Jeff Gaylord takes on an unknown quantity and Rasta the Voodoo Man. He has not been seen. We've just heard a lot about him. Lots and lots of press for Rasta the Voodoo Man. I wouldn't know him if he came in front of me right now, but I got a feeling. Hmm. Scott wouldn't know him if he came in front of him right now, but uh I mean he can pay for that, but <laughs> And then they also let us know that we're going to see some highlights from the first round of the GWF television title tournament. Now, I've got some screenshots here that we're going to kind of see how that first round played out. I know you've got a little bit of uh, insight for us about this. So this before is going to be a we, recap. Before we get to that, my favorite part of the opening was them claiming they had over 100 applicants to get into the GWF TV title tournament, which is both hilarious and tremendous. It's an absolutely ridiculous claim in hindsight, but with the backstory they provided, it's a nice way to attempt to make their promotion look way more important than it actually was. Yes, and I, as a kid, I'm picturing 100 wrestlers with applications in right. their hands, standing in line, just... <laughs> Here you go. Hope, hope they pick me. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. there's Dusty name. Wolf and yeah. and uh, name. Because <laughs> even as a kid, when they say a hundred, I'm picturing like, all right, well, that's like twenty big stars, and the rest right. is like Jake the Milkman Milliman <laughs> and Nacho Barrera from. <laughs> Be like, sorry, Zan Panzer, we don't have room for you today. <laughs> he slips the mask off. What about Bryant Anderson? <laughs> no, mm. not him either. We'll just go ahead and list Zan Panzer as an alternate if you put that mask back on. <laughs> Zan Panzer, there's a throwback. To... <laughs> but anyway, yes, let's get to that recap of the brilliant first round of this title tournament. All right, so our first match of the first round, Billy Black defeats Brian Adias. All right, well, let's start with the obvious question. Who the fuck is Billy Black? Billy Black was, so Joe Petticino is from Atlanta and he had been featuring some uh, local promotions there in Atlanta, which is where the handsome stranger came from. Um, New Jack started in the local promotion there, Atlanta, big bully Busick started there. So Billy Black was a uh, moderately uh, well-known star in Atlanta around, uh, I keep okay. thinking the name of that promotion. I mean, let me let me rephrase. Like 2024 broadcast, Bob knows who Billy Black is, but 1991, 11 year old. Oh yeah, like, I mean, who? <laughs> like yeah, I I know now he fought Sabu and went to Japan, but like back then I was like, why is Brian Adias, who I've at least heard of, not winning this with his Russian leg sweep? Like, but that's that the only thing that I that I looking back on, I'm like, why did they not provide any context to who the hell some of these people right. were? I, mean, I know Joe's throwing them in there because, all right, he's from Georgia. He's good. But we have no idea, like you said, why he's beating Brian Adias. And if I'm at the Sportatorium, I know Brian Adias for a right. long, long time. What's, what's happening here? Maybe that was their way of showing that, you know, this is the Global Dome, not the Sportatorium. Yeah. So. Brian Adias would have won in the Sportatorium, but this is the, by God, Global Dome. See, we have a stage over there. That didn't used to be there. That's right. You see all that fresh paint on the wall? Right. <laughs> uh, I'll let you talk about Randy Rhodes. <laughs> Randy Rhodes, baby. It's pretty, yeah, I think it's weird. pretty obvious uh, who that is. Uh, I'm, I'm not real sure where he came up with this gimmick, Daddy. Yeah, I, it was kind of a stretch, I guess. But uh, yeah, somebody's like, hey, you're fat and blonde and curly haired. <laughs> you ever thought about being a Dusty Rhodes clone? And he's like, no, I can't say I have a deal, baby. But I guess uh, I guess if it's hard times, then uh, I guess I can do it. But he at least could have got some freaking cowboy boots. But That's true. Well, he beat Sweet Daddy Falcone, who sounds like a low-level Batman villain, to advance to round two. Um, is that, is this where we need to throw it through to the old uh, the old clip from the commentary here? Because that's from this right here when Sweet Daddy went down to Randy Rhodes. Well, this is this is what the announcer said. Match later on today. Bulldog by Randy Rhodes. You might say good night to Sweet Daddy. Good night, Sweet Daddy. Hmm. And I present that as exhibit A of this commentary is not great. <laughs> I mean, I'm not denying that, but I still think it's better than Herb Abrams and Bruno muttering. Oh, good night, sweet daddy. Good night, 
Sweet daddy. Bulldog. <laughs> Big Randy Rhodes gives you a bulldog. You're not kicking out. I don't care how sweet you are, daddy. <laughs> Moving on. Yes. Now, there's a match I was interested in. All right. We got the master of karate. Educated feet. Of Sweet Stan Lane taking on the Patriot. I feel like this would have been a decent match if they'd showed more than like 11 seconds of it. Which makes you wonder, was it a decent match because they chose to show 11 seconds of it? or So how long did it take you watching this at 11 to figure out, oh, hey, that's the trooper from the AWA that was tagging with DJ Peterson and was the tag team champion. I can't say that I ever figured it out back then because I didn't. I mean, I watched some AWA, but I don't know that I would have put that together because I really don't remember that late stage team challenge series AWA. Blocked it out, did you? I did. <laughs> that was some PTSD, I think. Yeah, can't blame you there. Uh, it, it wasn't. It wasn't great. Uh, of course, you know we did get enough clip to see Stan Lane bust a move here. You know, because not only does he have educated feet, but he has some some he, sweet dance moves to to boot. So he is uh, the gangster of love, or was that? Was that damn sure. Uh, so do, do you want to do you want to educate us on the Patriot here? Or do we want to save that till once we get past the TV title tournament? No, this is probably a good time. I I did write a little bit about the Patriot because he did end up being Global's big star for. At least the first year or so of their existence. He was um, their Sting. He was their their Hulk Hogan. Their Jerry Lawler. Yeah, and I like their Wild Thing Steve Ray. My notes list: Lane, we of course all know as a master of martial arts and one half of the second best version of the Midnight Express. And if anyone wants to fight about that, Gene will be happy to answer your tweets. Um, Bring them on. <laughs> The Patriot is an interesting case of marketing and what could have been. Formerly the trooper in the AWA, as Gene mentioned, Del Wilkes would be christened the Patriot and made the face of the Global Wrestling Federation. He would go on to win the TV title tournament, and then he would give up that title and win the tournament for the GWF North American title. However, the win was disputed, and he was such a babyface, he actually gave the title back and then defeated Al Perez in the rematch for said title to become the champion. Then Doug Gilbert, who I believe Gene also does a podcast with that you should be listening to, arrived as the Dark Patriot, and the Battle of the Patriots began, which Dell lost, and then he left the GWF. He would then have several tryout matches with the WWF and a successful run in Japan before turning up in WCW, where he was part of a successful tag team with Marcus Alexander Bagwell, known here as the Handsome Stranger, as Stars and Stripes, two-time WCW Tag Team Champions. He then returned to Japan after leaving WCW and eventually signed with WWF in 1997, where he quickly found himself feuding with Bret Hart, who was a heel at the time as part of the Hart Foundation. Wilkes actually got over pretty well in the WWF, wouldn't you say, Gene? Yeah, he really did. Um, Even in the the Attitude Era where... uh, true blue American Patriot wasn't necessarily what people were digging at the time, but you know, he had a good build and he was a pretty decent worker and Brett was being kind of an asshole at the time with all that Canada stuff. So uh, he fit right in. He unfortunately suffered a torn tricep heading into survivor series and was replaced in his match and released soon after Wilkes retired in 1998 due to that injury spent nine months in prison in 2002 after forging a prescription for painkillers And then after that, he got clean and worked for a South Carolina car dealership. He would also go on to create a documentary about his football and wrestling career that documented his drug and steroid abuse called Behind the Mask. And then ultimately, he would pass away at the age of 59 from a heart attack in 2001. And you can unfortunately still find Tom Brandy using his gimmick without permission on the independent circuit today. That's true. Don't be don't be confused. If you hear the Patriots coming to your town, Del Wilkes is still passed on. It is actually going to be Salvatore Sincere. Either Salvatore Sincere, Tom Brandy, or some other asshole that continues to steal the gimmick, much like the 9,000 doinks and yeah. their gimmick are uh, robbed every day. So here's a fun little uh, trivia question for you. 
The Patriot often teamed to Japan with a guy named the Falcon who wore an outfit similar to his, but kind of reversed the colors. Do you know who played that character? Was that Jackie Fulton? Yes. I was shocked to learn that at one point, that Jackie Fulton, who did nothing really of note in the United States other than be Bobby's gangly cousin, <laughs> and when people would see posters, the Fantastics were coming town, and they'd get excited just to find out Tommy Rogers isn't there. It's Jackie <laughs> Fulton, and they're like, damn it. Uh, but he did have a pretty successful run in Japan, team with the Patriots, so he had that going for him, which is nice, as they say. Hey guys, Ray Russell here, curator of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, inviting you guys to listen to many of the programs here as part of the WrestleCopia brand, including, but not limited to, the Wrestling Memory Grenade, currently covering the 1988 and the WWF project. You can also listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories, whether it's Jamie Ward with Georgia 81, Roman Gomez with the UWF in 1986, or Gene Jackson covering Memphis in 85. Three projects going on right now over there at Regional Wrestling. You can also listen to the Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. Bob goes back in time each and every week, covering not just his career, but countless stories and interactions with hundreds of wrestling names spanning his two decades in the business. But that's not all. You can also check out the Puro Wrestling Academy with the professor of Puro Resu, Mr. Dan Ginnity. Dan and I go back in time and cover the history of Japanese professional wrestling in the English language. And you can listen to all of those shows and more, all part of the WrestleCopia podcast network, located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Pocket Cast, and beyond. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to our social media guys for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia podcast network. Plus, I'm constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history. You can follow us over on X, formerly Twitter, at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And why not subscribe to YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. So if you're looking to support that next up-and-coming podcast brand, please consider making it WrestleCopia. Hey everybody, Gene Jackson here inviting you to check out the Retro Wrestling Review, where each week I'm joined by some great co-hosts who help me review classic episodes of USWA Championship Wrestling, and right now we are doing week-by-week -week reviews of 1993. But we don't just do reviews, sometimes we get a chance to interview some of the people who were there and lived it, plus do watch-alongs. It's a lot of fun, so check out new episodes that drop every Wednesday at WrestleCopia.com. And to find links to everything associated to the podcast, you can go to USWAPodcast.com. All right, so... Uh, so we, we go from the Patriot versus Stan Lane, which was probably a good match, to the next match. <laughs> While Bill Irwin defeats Phantasma. Phantasma being the father of current WWE star Santos Escobar. Bill Irwin being the goon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when you when you translate that match to WWE speak, whew, yikes. <laughs> I will say that in the clip they showed, Irwin took it with a really nice looking gut wrench suplex, which is a move you really don't see enough these days. No, you don't. You certainly don't. And the next match, or as Corey Mack say, yeah, the next bout. <laughs> Terry Garvin defeats <laughs> the Zebra Kid and who's sporting all black here because nothing says Zebra like a solid black singlet and black mask. Yeah. I, I have a theory that they had Ted Petty booked for this and he backed out and they just like, has anybody got a mask going out there? <laughs> or do you think they just stole the name straight up and had no intention of having the real Zebra Kid there? Not to correct you, but Petty was the Cheetah Kid. Cheetah Kid. Well, all right, then. This Zebra asshole. Kid was actually a British wrestler, and I'm 100% certain it is not that Zebra Kid because he was skinnier than Ted Petty would have been at that point in his career. How do you so, not have zebra stripes on if you're going to call yourself that? Because I'm assuming that they saw the name, many people to think it was a British guy, and then stuck some fat kid in a jobber mask. So, But let's talk about Terry Garvin. <laughs> let's. <laughs> Well, let's begin with the fact that it's not that Terry Garvin. 
No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. That's really important to note. <laughs> not the one you would have heard mentioned in the, the Vince McMahon documentary <laughs> recently. However. Yes. So this guy started out as Terrence the Beauty Garvin. I first saw him in Memphis. He was tagging with Mark Gulleen, the Beast. They were Beauty and the Beast. They made their way to Continental. And he did look tremendously similar to Jimmy Garvin. He didn't have the huge bulbous head that Jimmy Garvin <laughs> had. But he did look like his little brother. And then all of a sudden, Global comes around. And Terry Garvin now has short hair. And eventually, he would shed the name after... Because it wasn't it was around this time when everybody really found out that the other Terry Garvin was not someone you wanted to share a name with in any shape or form. And we find out he's actually Terry Sims. He is. And um, he was a mediocre worker. He certainly wasn't the worker that Jimmy Garvin was. And I mean, depending no. on how you feel about Jimmy Garvin, I don't know if that's a I compliment. I think he was the worker Precious was for that matter. <laughs> that's but true. Uh, I, I'm sure he's managed to outclass the Zebra kid here. Yes. So. I'd still say Sunshine's the best worker of the bunch, but you know, <laughs> that's fair. Uh, she's she's worked. She's managed to work her way out of the public spotlight, and which makes her smarter than ninety nine percent of every wrestler in the planet. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, mm. are we ready for the next one? Yes. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Where to start? Is it Private Terry Daniels or is it Muck in the Sing? So, people, I mean, I I had read in magazines for years that, and I had never heard it said out loud, so I always read it, Macon Singh or Macon Singh um, was in Canada and Stampede, and then Norman the Lunatic shows up in WCW, and then I find out, like, oh, that's that guy I've read about in Stampede and seen those pictures of. And so Norman leaves WCW, he ends up in the GWF, and to their credit, he doesn't just arbitrarily show up as Muck and Sing. They acknowledge that this is Norman. They have a little fun with it, actually. Um, and here he's, and this picture is unfortunate for Terry Daniels' picture right here, as he's about to fall into the Bat Cave. Um, <laughs> the Bastion Booker Bat Cave. <laughs> uh, I forgot uh, about that, Gene. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. All right. By any name, Mike Shaw gets the win here. <laughs> and what can we say about Private Terry Daniels other than apparently Private Terry Daniels was still working in 1991? News to me, but there he was. <laughs> Precisely. Still wowing the fans, no yes. doubt. Next. <laughs> oh my. Conan Chris Walker taking on Doug Summers. Former AWA Tag Team Champion, Doug Summers. Who looks to be about 64 years old in this match. But let's talk about Chris Walker. The real Conan. I will stand behind that he is better than Mexican Conan. Well, that's and I don't... Just... And I'll, I'm trying to fight that's people tonight, racist. apparently. That's no, 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 racist. not because he's Mexican, because Conan sucks. Now, I noticed when you were trying to pick a fight earlier, when you said that the Bob Eaton and Stan Lane Midnight Express was the second, your second favorite version of Midnight Express. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention that your first favorite is actually Bob Holly <laughs> Bob and Mark Gunn. That is absolutely true. No. <laughs> that's that's when we know Bobby you really want to fight. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. Behind Bobby and Dennis. And I said oh, they can tweet okay. you about oh. that one. They can tweet me about Chris Walker being better than Conan L. Barbaro. Because that guy sucks. Well, we have a little clip of Doug Summers here. Do you want to? Do you want to finish your uh, my diatribe about Chris Chris Walker before we show this, or do we want to see Chris Walker? Do you feel like Chris Walker was like? I mean, the guy had so many opportunities. Like WWF hired him. I think he wrestled a couple dark matches in WCW. The guy had a hell of a crossbody. I mean, he had the body, and he just never made it. Yeah, I, opinion. to me, Chris Walker was one of those guys where people kept looking at him and going, ah, God dang it, he's got he's, he's got to have it. Look at him. He Look look at how he looks. He's got to have it. We got to just drag it out of him. Surely we can drag it out of him. Nobody was able to drag it out of him. He had the look. He didn't have much else. He's still uh, better than Tell Rowdy, me the greatest Rowdy Chris Rowdy Walker Rowdy. match. 
Tell me the greatest Chris Walker match you ever saw. Oh, I mean, I can't do that, but I'd still rather watch him. Yeah, exactly, because the there, there's not him. one. Um, <laughs> you know, he looked great in an eight by ten, uh, but once once you had to watch him in the ring, it was kind of it was kind of downhill. It's kind of like Gaylord. You know, for years people just kept banging their head against the wall, like this Gaylord guy. We got to be able to do something with him. Look at him. No, True, well, it's because he was a flaming idiot. But I mean, but uh, seriously though, can you name me one Conan match you enjoyed? All of them. I mean, my gosh, he's a he's a Mexican legend. He's, <laughs> so is Vampiro. That doesn't mean he's good. A favorite match of Vampiro, the casket match with Sting that immediately followed. My favorite, my favorite ironic moment of all time. Not the sidebar here. WCW Bash of the Beach, the big shoot Vince Russo Hogan Jarrett debacle. <laughs> where the announcers are going, that wasn't supposed to happen. That wasn't in the script. This is real. This thing has turned real here at the Bash at the Beach. And now we go to a cemetery <laughs> graveyard match between Sting and Vampiro. I'm like, whoa, way to keep that real yeah. vibe going there, guys. And a bunch of dummies. <laughs> All right, show your Chris Walker clip. <laughs> All right. Take a look here at... Former tag team champion Pretty Boy Doug Summers soaring through the air with the greatest of ease. And you can tell he had never been on the flying trapeze. God help Summers, us. after that great offensive move, could not keep the momentum to go right out. He looks like he wants to go to the top. He couldn't do it really quick. He had to stop and catch his breath because they've just been going at it so hard. Maybe any misses. Nobody home in Conan land. <laughs> Chris Benoit had long darted his own head in the mat. Every night to that extent. Ooh, that kid wouldn't have seen two. See, that looked like Jesus, Gene. <laughs> oh, Lord. I was going to say that looked like Barry Windham had a stroke, but <laughs> mid, mid dive. Because right. he just like... went straight down. I watched that clip four times when I you sent me the, you know, the, the time stamp on it and I clipped it. And I literally watched it four times. I'm like, his head drove straight into the mat. I mean, good gosh. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody drive their own head in the mat like that. I don't even know. He might have been supposed to have won, but there was no getting up after that. Good Lord. So, well, if this show can't get any worse, next up is Rip Rogers. <laughs> The Hustler, Rip Rogers against the Hitman. And if you're asking yourself, wow, I don't remember Bret Hart being in GWF. That's because he wasn't. Um, no, I'm assuming this is just the Zebra Kid again with a different mask. But... Well, he's in slightly better shape, but that singlet may just be holding him in a little tighter because he's got tights and a singlet both. Um, I don't know who that is, but... Uh... He fell to Rip Rogers. So. He did. Rip Rogers hit it, hit him with a DDT that would have drove Jake Roberts back to the pipe. So, <laughs> well played. Um, yes. <sighs> so we are now ten and a half minutes into this show, <laughs> off from the tournament recap. I just wanted to point that out. I time stamped that myself. It took him ten and a half minutes to recap the tournament so far. Yes, the only thing that would have been worse than that is if we'd had to sit through. I mean, okay, shy of Stan Lane and the Patriot, was there any matches right there that you would have wanted to see any more than those clips that they showed? And I actually mean, any of those that you actually wanted to see the clips that they showed? I mean, if there was any more of Lucha Doug Summers, <laughs> I'd have watched that match. But... <laughs> <laughs> El Pretty Boy. <laughs> oh! Lucha, Lucha. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Before we get to our first match of the day, we have a promo from one mm. of our favorites, um, the one and only Nature the Boy, Nature Boy, Buddy Landell. Check this out, folks. So many Nature Boys in professional wrestling. I'm here with the man who claims to be the only Nature Boy, Nature Boy Buddy Landell. 
Well, I don't see that there are many plurals, Buddy Rogers, 60s, Ric Flair in the 80s, Nature Boy, Buddy Landell in the 90s. And the reason why they call me the Nature Boy is for uh, the simple reason Sean Connery calls me up and asks me about women. Let's move on to other things, man. Let's talk about them people out there that are nothing but wannabes that didn't get an education or sitting at an armchair right now telling their old lady sipping on a beer, I should, I could, I would have. But the bottom line is you didn't. I'm here and you're there. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And whoever I come in contact with in global wrestling, I'm going to stomp a mud hole in him and walk it dry. What do you think about that, Scott? Well, Buddy Landell certainly has a storied history in professional wrestling fans. Buddy Landell here in global professional wrestling to wreak havoc. Buddy, who are you looking for? I don't care. I'm looking for the money. That's what I'm talking about. I want to tell the promoters it takes, it, you got to pay the cost to be the boss. If you want Nature Boy Buddy Landell, throw the green down, then I'll sell you some tickets. That's exactly where I'm coming from. <laughs> throw the green down and I will sell you some tickets. If Buddy Landell was still with us today, I would be going out of my way to try to have a weekly Buddy Landell podcast. And now that I have Doug Gilbert and Tommy Rich on my side, I might would have found a way to make that happen. At least one interview, if nothing else, if not more. I love Buddy. Like he like half that didn't make a lick of sense, but it was still amazing. Just the swagger that he delivers it with. Right. You know, the content doesn't, doesn't even matter. Fun. It just no. it comes across. Mm -hmm. And you can see it in his face. He, you can tell he wanted to slap Scott Hudson. He goes, oh, one of the many nature boys. You can be like, really? You're going to say that with me standing right next right. to you, you ball-headed turd? <laughs> um, so now we're ready for our first. We're about 12 minutes into this show. We're Ooh. ready for our first match. And it's a doozy, folks. A battle of, as Scott Hudson put it, two Britons. Uh, <laughs> That's a proper term. Axel Rotten taking on exotic Adrian Street. Now, for some reason, in 1991, Miss Linda was not present with Exotic Adrian Street. And if you're an ECW fan, when you hear me say Axel Rotten, you're picturing Axel Rotten from ECW. Well, get that no. picture out of your head because that's not what 1991 Axel Rotten looked like. 1991 Axel Rotten looked like this. <laughs> and this. Oh my. He may have one of the all time stupid wrestling haircuts. It was bad. He looks, I mean, he looks like a cartoon <laughs> character. <laughs> right? Like, he looks like one of the Ninja Turtles villains before they got that ooze shit all over him. I mean, if you if you colored his head yellow, he'd look like a Simpsons character. <laughs> I mean, look at the shape of it, look at the roundness of his face. Right? And head. You're not wrong. Sure but enough. he is. He is the global Commonwealth champion. That's right. And you can't take that away from the very highly esteemed <laughs> Commonwealth title. I've got a couple of clips from this one. Uh, Adrian Street apparently wasn't too impressed with Axel either. Take a look at Adrian mocking poor Axel right Exotic here. Exotic Adrian Street coming in at a little bit over 220. So the weight advantage on the tail of the tape goes to Axel, and Axel's going, I don't know. Uh oh hello. How are you, Mr. Rotten? Well, what a better way to introduce yourself, and uh, I don't think I ever want to meet anybody like that, but Axel, look, look, it's got Axel on the run. <laughs> Adrian says, I can do the Rotten Trot. Rotten Trot, that's rotten a new one. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, my goodness. The pulsating pecs, and the Rotten's going. Oh, Hello. Well, hello. Was we the four of those in that one clip there from Craig Johnson? Uh, the Craig, Rotten Trot. I'd say Craig Johnson's done the Rotten Trot in his hotel room before. So, uh, yeah, that's that's why we don't need uh, Craig Johnson ad libbing out here. We get the Rotten Trot. Now, to be fair to Axel Rotten, I had watched Adrian's career from the time I first started watching wrestling. That's the biggest I've ever seen Adrian Street. Is quite pudgy for what I'm used to seeing Adrian Street there. Uh, he would be, I, I would s see him and do some shows with him later about probably mm, eight years after this. And he would more resemble the old Adrian we remembered from Mid-South and Continental. But at this point, yeah, he was hardly recognizable, but he's still next to Axel. He still looked to be in yes. quite good shape. Uh, so then... Uh, Axel Rotten manages to. Well, is there any other notes you have about this match before I skip to the ending? Well, we do have the part where the announcer spent several minutes making up reasons that Axel was thrown off his soccer team, <laughs> including his haircut, 
and kicking the coach who also happened to be his father. <laughs> this was like a horrible improv group happening. Cause you I mean, you just tell these guys, you literally can tell these guys are just making this shit up off the top of their head. And it's, not even it's not entertaining it's just like what are we doing i mean at least while that was happening street was working a series of submissions on him that were kind of entertaining so but yeah for it was pretty piss poor yeah i mean but it poor adrian the size it was, it was just two fat dudes rolling around <laughs> on each other it's kind of awkward but uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh so axel ends up using a, I guess in this instance, it'll be an international object would be the appropriate term. Oh, yes. Uh, to get the win, and then this happens. A series of forearms and referee Sean O'Brien. Axel Rodden has him and hits Adrian Street with it. Puts it under his arm. Count of one, count of two, count of three. Axel Rodden is upset Adrian Street. Wait a minute. The referee saw it before an object. He raised his hand. The ring announcer was already announcing the winner, Craig, and the referee, Sean O'Brien, found the foreign object that Axel Rodden used. He's declaring Street the winner. I hate when that happens. Now, to be fair, I don't know if in 91 that has such an overused finish at that point. Now in the years since I've seen that done thousand and one times, especially on little local indie shows and such. But I mean, that might've been innovative in 91. I don't know. I hadn't been to a lot of shows in person at that point, but as soon as he tucked it under his arm, like, Oh gee, I wonder what's fixing to happen here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, on the plus side, at least we don't have to see Axel Rotten anymore in the tournament if you're watching every day. There is that. Um, man, yeah, this uh, much better presentation of Axel Rotten and ECW than what we were getting in 91. But, I mean, again, to be fair, this was very early in his career. so That is uh, true. He's still figuring it out. But, yeah, I mean, as far as what they said on commentary, it's believable that he could have been kicked out of anything. Soccer, his home, anywhere for that haircut. <laughs> It was pretty bad. Out of the sportatorium for that haircut. <laughs> pretty so that bad. brings us to, uh, to match a match number two. That's going to make that match look like Steamboat versus Savage. <laughs> <laughs> Rasta the Voodoo Mon taking Ooh. on <sighs> Jeff Gaylord. Now, so allegedly Bill Eadie's booking this stuff around this time or had a big hand in it. Like, come on, superstar. You looked around the dressing room, saw those two guys, and thought, boy, I bet if I paired them up, that'd be great. <laughs> now, let's do a little... Rasta would go on to become Terry Tate, office linebacker, for anyone who might remember those commercials. That's uh, right. Jeff, Jeff Gaylord would go on to become a bank robber, for anyone who might have been there that day. <laughs> Convicted felons. <laughs> Uh, Gaylord does have a pretty spectacular mullet, though, so we have to give him a few points for that. Um, yeah, and then, then the match starts and it all goes to hell. Yeah, I, you know, for years, I did not realize that Roster the Voodoo Man was Terry Tate, office linebacker, and that he actually has been in a lot of television shows and movies. Um, he actually had quite a acting career when he left wrestling. He was a lot more successful in the acting biz <laughs> He'd have to than be. he was in the wrestling business, so uh, that was... That was pretty interesting to, to learn, actually. So uh, let's uh, let's take a look at a little bit of the action here of uh, Rasta Ooh. and Jeff Gaylord. Tight you have ever seen. Wow! Look at the body on this guy. He's doing. He's done more than sling pineapples or whatever they do where he's from down there. He is huge. My Rasta the Voodoo Man. Talk about two chiseled out individuals in Gaylord. Look at his shoulder, shoulder, Craig, after that. that... I threw that clip in because now, granted, I'm a guy that that doesn't enjoy present day wrestling and and I I like to watch old wrestling. 
But, you know, when you hear guys my age going, oh, wrestling was a lot better back in my day. It's a lot more believable. We just saw a voodoo man rub his shoulder, and the other guy sold it in 1991. Well, first of all, let's start with the slinging pineapples comment, because I don't think that would get over today. But we'll move on from there. Yes, uh, yes, wrestling was a lot more realistic back in our day. These kids with their flippy shit is all fake. I mean, Did your shoulder hurt yet, Gene? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Voodoo. And what's crazy, and what I mean, it's not really going to spoil anything to just say this now before we take a look at these other couple more clips. But like, so before the match, Roster rubs his shoulder. Jeff's like, oh, oh man, my shoulder. But then the finish, Jeff runs shoulder first into the ring post and it gets rolled up. And they mentioned, like, oh, we saw him holding his shoulder before the match. Like, it rammed into the ring post. What the fuck does it matter? <laughs> right. <laughs> if he had rubbed it before the match. And yeah. he had, so if you run into steel and you haven't been voodooed, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I've long since said, like I say, I'll, 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 I'll dunk on current wrestling with the best of them. But, I mean, you know, you look back, back in our day, People finished matches with sleeper holds, and we pretended that the only person who could wake that guy up was the guy who did it. He had to slap him right between the shoulders. And if it wasn't the guy who did it, it didn't work. Nobody knew he was dead. People were running there in a panic. They're like, oh my God, he, he better wake him back up. He, he's been out for a dangerously long time. Like, well, why don't the referee just slap him across the shoulders? You know? That didn't work. But, you know. Brutus Beefcake could cut your hair, perform open heart surgery on you, and as long as he didn't slap you on the shoulders, you weren't waking up. You were out in, indefinitely. Who uh, the hell needs roofies when you got a sleeper hold? <laughs> exactly. I mean, <laughs> and then the guy who's most famous for uh, making thousands of dollars now doing a weekly podcast shitting on AEW and any other current stuff he doesn't like, Booked a freaking mummy and a ninja turtle on his shows. So, hey, yeah. maybe you not, shouldn't cast the first stone there, brother. But anyway, uh, uh, and shit, I like the guy. You're going to get people after us now. I'll bring it on. I don't care. <laughs> I've said that on shows before. I like Cornette. I don't love that he spends half a wrestling podcast ranting about politics and everything else under the sun that is like, hey, I'm coming to a wrestling podcast to get away from all that crap. I don't need to hear more of it you know, on here, but... Anyway, let's take a look at uh, some of Rasta's unique offense. Mm. The Voodoo Man steps over, comes down, and oh! Right to the chest! The Voodoo Man goes up, comes down with a leg drop! Holy <laughs> shit, Hogan wishes he could hit a leg drop like that, brother. <laughs> that knee, that phantom knee was... The voodoo that took him down. Apparently. Exactly, there was there was voodoo energy coming off that knee. Ooh. So I I do want to point out if anybody actually watches this, Gaylord hits a drop kick. That's probably the best thing I've ever seen Gaylord do ever in this match. So I wanted to give him some credit for that, along with his mullet. And I think yeah. Gaylord was as surprised as anybody when he hit that <laughs> drop kick. Like, did I do that? Did, did Brad Arm did this voodoo guy just make Brad Armstrong inhabit my body? What the hell was that? Maybe that's what happened. Holy <laughs> shit, I didn't think of that. He was... Brad was still around at that point, but <laughs> maybe Brad was there watching me. He was like, ooh da, and like yeah. moved. Brad see Brad's drop kicking Rostin. Like, I was at a worldwide taping two seconds ago. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's what happened. Brad was at a worldwide taping and he went for a drop kick and totally botched it and got quantum up. leaped into freaking exactly. Jeff Gaylord in Dallas. Maybe like, he got God. I was about to get a Vader bomb two seconds ago. <laughs> All right. So now we saw Rasta's unique offense by the same token. Let's take a look at some of Gaylord's unique offense. Oh, shit. Uh, we heard about the drop kick, but what do you call this? One man. He's been double team, triple team like anybody else has, but there's a great shot by Jeff Gaylord to the midsection, and Rasta is stunned. Watch Gaylord. Another shot to the midsection. Gaylord fighting back. Rasta again, another shot. Gaylord coming back. Could this be the big Superman comeback by Gaylord. Those right hands, those singing right hands. Gaylord's getting pumped into the ropes. Comes back a right hand that drops to the big Rasta the Voodoo Man. <laughs> That was a leaping cocksucker into three punches into a Spider-Man punch. The most awkward punches you've ever seen thrown in your life. 
followed what about, by a diving. I hope that's not what motivated Roman Reigns to, hey, I'm going to use that because that looked amazing. Well, that was not a Superman punch. Well, you got to think of like the worst superhero we can imagine. That was the Superman punch. Yeah. I don't know what you would call that, but it was it was sad. And then that like leaping head to the groin thing that he did to start it. That's the one that got me. He he jumped up. That's probably one of the more athletic things I've seen him do, though. He jumped from his knees up into like a battering ram into the stomach. It was very uh, unique. Uh, what a maneuver. That would have been. <laughs> Jim or Jim Ross would have said, uh, or uh, unorthodox offense from Jeff Gaylord. We'll stick he with learned him. that at the University of Missouri. And... <laughs> he played football. Oh, my God. He used to do that on the line in University of Missouri. He couldn't do it to the Sooners. <laughs> he would have never done that to the Sooners. Boomer Sooner. <laughs> so uh, and then so eventually Gaylord would give way, like we said, his his shoulder that had been voodooed before the bell even rang, met the turnbuckle, and uh, he got rolled up and lost to Rasta the Voodoo Mon, the future Terry Tate office linebacker, which I would have rather seen that gimmick here. <laughs> so you can only assume this being 91 that um, sorry, Papa Shango was born out of this. Had that to they be. saw a voodoo gimmick in Texas and like, well, they didn't do it worth a damn, but that's an interesting concept. Had but, to you be. Know, you know, maybe if they made him sweat oil from the top of his head and puke a few times... It would have got over. It would have got over because clearly it worked for Sean Go and the Ultimate Warrior a year or two later. Had to be. After this, we cut to a backstage promo where Bonnie Blackstone is talking to someone who is allegedly a fan named Freddie who looks like Tiny Tim Jr. I expect <laughs> him to pull out a ukulele and start singing Tiptoe Through the Tulips. He kind of you know who like, that guy I, is. He kind of looks like Tiny Tim fucked on Callus. That's, that's all oh, I got. Hey, you nailed it. Absolutely. And I uh, still want to know how Joe Pettacino got Bonnie Blackstone. But... Well, we'll get there eventually. Uh, I don't know how he got her, but Burt Prentice speculates that that was more of a, a, a brother-sister type relationship more than the, uh, mm. you know, anyway. Uh, and actually, Freddie there, he's he's presented as a fan. That's actually flamboyant Freddie Fargo, a uh, a manager and uh, magazine writer. Uh, oh, okay. From the, from the 90s. I don't know why they chose to. He was, a, he was supposedly a fan, but he was putting over uh, Muck and Singh, who we're going to be seeing in a little bit anyway. So I don't really know what, what purpose that served. But anyway, that's going to lead us to match number three. Hold on. Are we skipping over the wrestling news center? Yes, go ahead and. and, and <laughs> I just thought it was interesting. They had this wrestling news center segment where they were talking about their TV again. They recap the TV title tournament again, like we didn't yeah. just have ten minutes devoted to that. But it was interesting to me. We had Scott Hudson dropping words like Japanese style and lucha libre, like he was like they were almost aiming this at the smart fans. Yeah, in 1991, which I just. I thought it was worth mentioning because it was kind of interesting because it wasn't something you saw anywhere else. And I know in the future they would actually start giving out like WWF results and WCW title changes and stuff like that on this segment. So, which was kind of unique for the time period. So, just so full mention. disclosure, as soon as I saw them recapping the TV title tournament again, I fast forwarded through it and I <laughs> missed the part where Scott Hudson said Lucha Libre and Japanese style. So, anyway, that's, right, that's on my ad right there. We'll return after these messages. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling, the podcast that's based on the old school but can still help you find the good stuff from today. Jimmy Street and the Plastic Sheik, Jared, are the undisputed tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise. This team does it all. And all they ask is, give me back my pro wrestling. Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Hey guys, this is Wolfie D from PG-13. Check out my podcast, Live and in Color with Wolfie D, every Monday at noon. We're talking Memphis, we're talking ECW, WCW, WWF, everywhere that I've been. We even have some great guests, some Hall of Famers on the show with us. Every Monday at noon, Live and in Color with Wolfie D. Hey, it's Bob Smith, and guess what? The Outdated Wrestling Hour is now part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. But hey, no fear, you're still going to hear the unique guests, comedy, music, authors, journalists, funny people. Who knows who's going to end up on the Outdated Wrestling Hour. Remember, it's all new and all old. So check it out in the WrestleCopia Podcast Network and wherever you get your podcasts. Listen, if you know what's good for you. Next match is going to be Big Bully Busick against Jimmy James. And, of course, you know who Jimmy James is. No. Neither do I. I okay, hope, perfect. I hope if I said that I gave that lead in, you <laughs> might would have some idea, because I certainly didn't. Um, well, whoever he is, he decides to Pearl Harbor Busick, because that's what baby faces do. Now, before we get to that, okay. earlier in the show... um. There was this little faux pas from Scott Hudson when he realizes he exposed where Big Bully's actually from rather than this dumbass hometown that he that he claims. Let's take a look at this little clip right here. Jimmy James to take on Big Bully Busick from Powerhouse Hill. I'm very, very familiar with Big Bully Busick. He's from Atlanta, Georgia. Well, he wrestles in Atlanta, Georgia. He will never let you forget he is from Powerhouse Hill. I'm very familiar Weirton, with Busick. West Virginia. In Weirton, West Virginia. Should be Weird Town, West Virginia, if that's where Busick is from. That's going to be. So he realizes right after he says it, like, oh, shit. Yeah, nobody. <laughs> he's not supposed to be from Atlanta. He's supposed to be from Powerhouse Hill. The thing is, this show wasn't live. This, right. They could have reshot that. But, I mean, apparently... They had Gene Jackson directing it, and while well, broadcast Bob would have been off the side, go, "Hey, we need to do do that." And I'm like, "No, we don't we're reshoot not, anything here. We're not reshooting shit. Uh, <laughs> nobody cares where the hell he's from, and nobody knows where Powerhouse Hill in Weirton, West. Ri I'd rather be from Atlanta than than say I'm from Powerhouse Hill in Weirton, West West Virginia. Do you have any idea where that's? Is that a real place? It is. I mean, is Powerhouse Hill a real place? Oh, I don't know about that. Weirton but, is a real place. Weirton Wrestling. I actually gym. used to work with a guy who Busick was his wrestling coach in, or his weightlifting coach when he was in high school. And that's a true story. <laughs> wow. That's... That was years after Busick had retired. This was probably in the early... I met the guy in 99-ish, maybe early 2000. So this would have been in the late 90s if the guy was his weightlifting coach oh my okay yep. well that's that's fun i didn't know that he really really was from there i just thought that yeah no he really he arbitrarily really picked that him. place because it had a place called powerhouse hill that he wanted. well I, he may have made that shit up but I, I that part i don't know but yeah weirton is a real place well what do you know you learn something new every freaking day up in here so uh all right so let's let's take a look at one of the moments from this match that is a pretty reverse arm drag from Big Bully. Take a look at this. Chop across the chest. And the chant of Mario rings out. Oh, pretty reverse arm drag. That takes some power in the biceps. Absolutely. One arm. He took a big 240, 230 pound man over in a complete flip with just his left arm his left arm and he's a righty now they gun to your head you had to describe that reverse arm drag how many words would have came to mind before the word pretty how many words do i know gene <laughs> <laughs> hmm. awkward that... reverse arm drag yeah, right. uh, piss poor <laughs> barely applied reverse <laughs> right. arm drag I mean, maybe if he'd thrown pretty much a reverse arm drag in there. <laughs> I mean, Passable. But th that wasn't the weirdest spot in the match, though. Like, there was, did you did you see the part where <coughs> James is, like, doing a bunch of piss-poor offense on him, and then for some reason, Busick turns around and single-legs the referee and tries to pin him? Yes. Like, what the fuck was that? I meant to clip that, and I got sidetracked and didn't. That was so weird. <laughs> I mean... 
were they trying to act like he was blinded at the moment or like I that was again moments that probably could have gotten cut before it made it its way to ESPN. Yeah, I, I didn't I don't know if Busick was like messing with the ref or I, I don't know. It was something. So they make it a point to say because it's not like we're all we're not all sitting home thumbing through our copy of the global wrestling rule book. <laughs> But they make it a point to tell us that the heart punch is illegal in the global wrestling field. <coughs> Sorry. And then they tell us that Big Bully Busick uses the heart punch, but maybe it's not a heart punch. Maybe maybe it's something else. It's actually called the Bully Blaster. So, Bob, I, I don't. I know you've probably seen a few Ox Baker matches in your time, or mm-hmm. you've probably seen a heart punch or two. So. Take a look at this and tell me if the bully blaster looks familiar. He probably wants to be there. Oh, here it comes. Oh, this is it. It's a hard punch, but he calls it the bully blaster. Look, he just dropped. He just dropped. Well, what is this? What is he doing? Trying to make it look like a easy pin. Oh, come on. But the man who put Weirden on the map, that's where Powerhouse Hill is, and that's where your winner comes from. So I don't understand. I mean, usually they throw crap like that in to try to get a move over, but I didn't understand the whole, the heart punch is illegal. And then they go, this is a heart punch, the bully blaster. And then the referee doesn't DQ him or anything. I was expecting like there's going to be like the referee's going to call for the bail because he used the illegal heart punch. But no, he's put him in an awkward roll up that looked like he was about to take advantage of him after having yeah, knocked I'm, him out. I'm really not sure why that he had to finish with that like teabagging lucha pin. Yes. He... But I'm not sure that that was either a heart punch or a Phoenix splash. I'm not sure. Not Craig sure Johnson, which... the panic in Craig Johnson's voice when he flipped him over on his stomach, though. Oh, what? <laughs> Is he going to fucking him in the yeah, ass? He's about to molest him here on, <laughs> right on uh, ESPN. I'm pretty sure. I mean, the heart punch is illegal and global, but I'm I'm definitely sure rape is not allowed on ESPN anymore. Yeah. But, uh, Only after midnight. <laughs> we're on ESPN <laughs> eight during the blackout period. Can yeah. we do that? <laughs> so, uh, Jimmy James gets bully blasted in more ways than one, <laughs> <laughs> and Busick is victorious. So now, before uh, before we move on. Let's hear from the man who is no longer Norman the Lunatic. Well, let's just take a look. Do we Bobby have? Blackstone back with you again, fans. And everybody around the country and across the globe is asking the Global Wrestling Federation about their stars. Namely, you... Their star. Uh, their star. Me. Mucka Singh. Get the name right. They're not asking about stars. They're asking about star. Me. One of our viewers that was here at the Global Dome just uh, just moments ago asked us about you and the, the radical change once you were known as Norman. Lovel- Shut up with Norman. Shut up with Norman. Forget Norman. They should rename this place the Global Dome. Why don't they call it the Mucka Dome or Mucka Chapel, maybe? That would be nice, wouldn't it? Where, what about all the teddy bears? What about all your fans? Teddy bears and toys are a little for little snot-nosed, sniveling people like you, Blackstone. That's what they're for little snot-nosed people like you. So forget the teddy bears, forget the toys, look at this. It's time to come into Global Wrestling Federation and show just what I'm made of. Nobody leads me around, nobody tells me what to do. I just destroy and hurt people. And you know something, Blackstone? This is the last time I want to see you. Couple can things. We, can we rename this the Mucka Cast? We we if we were going to be call, calling his matches every week, we we'd have to. Uh, I always saw it spelled in Stampede M A K H A N. They had it much an. Um, <laughs> they spelled it exactly the way they said it. Uh, I, number one, I think there needs to be a rule <clears throat> if you're a male wrestler and your boobs are bigger than the female who's interviewing <laughs> you, you have to put a shirt on. Just non-negotiable unless you're abdullah unless you're abdullah okay um i agree we, then we'll make an exception uh but second of all you know when you hear people talk about the great promo guys in wrestling dusty Rhodes, rick flair 
You never hear that. Mike Shaw mentioned in that. I wonder why. I maybe he just didn't have enough airtime. Yeah, I mean, maybe as we move along here in global, if we get to watch some more stuff in the future, hopefully we'll get to hear some longer promos, and hopefully he'll uh, he'll have a top on next time. If this it's very <laughs> distracting, uh, but you know. We've gone through the whole show at this point. We're almost to the main event, Bob. Mm -hmm. And while this did get filmed on June 28th, 1991 and aired on July the 10th, 1991, I still don't feel like I'm back in 1991. I'm just not feeling it. Okay. Is there anything you can do to help get us back in that 1991 mindset here? Yeah, I think I can help you out. You know what the top movie at the box office was that week, Gene? What's that? Terminator 2 Judgment Day. I bet you've seen that. I have, numerous times. You know what the number one song in the United States was, Gene? Oh, God. I'm afraid to ask. It was Rush Rush by Paula Abdul. <laughs> I bet you've masturbated to her, Gene. <laughs> Not listening to that song. <laughs> I don't now think I could finish. But let's talk some wrestling. The same week this show aired... WCW announced that Ric Flair was being stripped of the World Heavyweight title on Saturday night. And that show was main evented. You ready for this? The Dangerous Alliance of Arn Anderson, Steve Austin, and Larry Sabisco. Cruncher. Took on Ron Simmons, Bobby Eaton, and the Yellow Dog. Oh, I was hoping he's going to say Big Josh, but still, that's pretty impressive. But the following night, they held their Great American Bash pay-per-view. <laughs> Which was originally supposed to be Ric Flair and Lex Luger for the title, but with Flair gone, Barry Windham stepped in, and they crowned the new WCW champion when Lex Luger took the title. Some other notable matches that evening, Gene? Yeah. PN News and Bobby Eaton defeated Steve Austin and Terry Taylor in a Capture the Flag scaffold match. Oh, Ron Simmons defeated Oz. Big Josh got the win over Black Blood in a Lumberjack match. Wait a minute. You can't just blow past that. Tell <laughs> oh, us yeah. what Black Blood was. Well, that would be Mr. Billy Jack Haynes, obviously. Tip of the hat to Billy Jack, a favorite from our past. And then finally, El Gigante won a six-minute classic over the one-man gang. What a show. What a show. <laughs> But over in the WWF, if that wasn't enough for you, if you want to get some more 1991 going on, over in the WWF, Sid made his WWF debut against Ted DiBiase in a dark match on a July 8th taping. On that same taping, in a segment that wouldn't air for over a month, Bobby Heenan appeared on WWF television with the NWA World Heavyweight Championship, signaling the arrival of Ric Flair. That same day that WCW held the Bash pay-per-view, WWF held WrestleFest 91. Main event of that show, the Hulkster defeated Sergeant Slaughter with some help from the Macho Man. Uh -huh. yeah. But you know those undercard matches on the WCW show? Yeah. WWF didn't want to be outdone. Other matches on this show saw Colonel Mustafa pin Jimmy Snuka. Oh. Davey Boy Smith defeat Typhoon by Countout. Bret Hart and Virgil get the win over Money Incorporated. Oh. And Carrie Von Erich wrestle the Warlord to a double count out because you don't want to make the Warlord lose. Oh my gosh. And finally, before we move on, I wanted to note this just for you, Gene. A few days earlier on July 6, 1991, down in Puerto Rico, the World Wrestling Council held their 18th anniversary show. And the main event that night saw the WWC Universal Heavyweight title change hands on a reverse decision as Carlos Colon lost that title. Do you want to know who he lost it to, Gene? I do. Dino Bravo. <laughs> oh, I, I will find footage of that so we can we can do a watch along of that. That would be tremendous. I know you love you some Dino Bravo. Oh, and man. That That's youngster... Cool. That youngster Carlos Colon is always one for a good match. Yeah, that kid's always going to put a banger on, as the kids say. 
If it wasn't all the way on the other side of the room, I would grab my my Dino Bravo action figure and and hold it up proudly here in front of the camera. I know you love you some Dino. I know I actually have that too. That's not a bluff. You know I actually have that. I truly think the only reason you bought that action figure so if you ever run into his daughter who you saw on Dark Side of the Ring and be like, look, 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 (laughs) because you know she was kind of hot. Anyway, for that last little bit of 1991 nostalgia, let's take a commercial break, Gene. Okay, let's see what uh, let's see what Bob Anderson has up his sleeve. We all know if you're a fan of the OWF, we know that Bob is a connoisseur of old school commercials, and uh, he can pick them. So let's see what's up. We'll return after these messages. Purple stuff, sun oh, delight. Sun delight. Oh, yeah. What's in this? Tastes like orange and tangerine. Yeah, why? Some healthy yeah. junk too. Whoa, 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 whoa! What are you doing? There's what? what? Problem, guys? No. Wait a minute, Mr. Jackson. Oh, right. Come on. Yeah. Sunny delight. The good stuff kids go for. Yeah. Yeah. Want some more? The unmen are back for revenge, and they want Swamp Thing. Weed killer's poisoning Swamp Thing's home. Who can save it? Swamp Thing! Nobody poisons the swamp trap. I live here. It's feeding time for my Venus flytrap. Ah! It won't stop me. Is this the ah! end of Swamp Thing? No. My mighty bog rover will put an end to you. Fire! Ah! Swamp Thing, oh! guardian of the earth. Swamp trap playset. Bog rover and figures sold separately. Ronald McDonald in a new do. Hey, maybe I could use a new hairstyle. What do you think, Bertie? Let me try it. <laughs> oh, huh. Cool. Me? Tis I, Sir Ronald. It's you. Bertie, this style really is me. Everybody loves it. We sure do, Ronald. <laughs> <laughs> nice do. Folks, it is now time for our main event, so let's head down to ringside here. All right. That sound down just a little bit. I don't need to hear that much Craig Johnson. And <laughs> uh, I'm so used to seeing gorgeous Gary Young as a heel. It's a little weird seeing. All right, well, let's hold on. Shenanigans are starting. <laughs> They're getting blast the referee. And then immediately tells the referee, he did it. I love it. James Beard's like, why did you hit me, Gary? <laughs> That's what I said. I, the, Buddy Landell puts on the healing of a lifetime in this match. And I know you said you've seen it on indie shows. I'd never seen it before, and I love it. Well, that's the great part is, like, I've seen it on, like, you know, house shows, spot shows. Like, I've never seen people do it on television. <laughs> And that's what's great about it is like Buddy seems like a genius, like because most folks had never seen it unless they seen somebody do it in person. And he does it again. <laughs> and he jumps down there by him. like like I care about you so much. Like, like oh James. <laughs> Are you okay, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> and then he just picks up the hair. And then, of course, like, I love it because you've got all the fans going, no, no, he didn't do it. We love Gary Young, even though we hated him six months ago. Exactly. And that's the best part, because Gary Young is like the sleaziest looking motherfucker you've ever seen. Exactly. Like, he looks like a porn star. And, or an 80s porn star. When, when we interviewed downtown Bruno recently, I don't remember if it was on, I think it was on the one man Doug did. He was basically like, yeah, Gary Young's a piece of shit. I can't stand that guy. I was like, oh. And then he pokes himself in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I absolutely like I've shown this match to so many people after I discovered it. And I because I obviously didn't remember it from when I was a kid, but when I was re-watching some global as an adult, I was like, holy shit, this is the best match ever. And it's great because it's it's a bunch of just simple, easy stuff. Right. And have you heard this crowd be this lively and this into anything we saw on this entire f- show up to here? Absolutely not. And there's not, a, you know, the closest thing to a bump has been <laughs> James Beard's taken more bumps than anybody in the damn match. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You can't use the 
referee here. The referee is doing his job. He heard that massive slap. All right. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> oh, we're gonna, we'll do some moves, I guess. We're four <laughs> minutes in. <sighs> I prefer short-haired Gary Young like this. Really, I always like this him. easy looking mullet. When he's got the mullet that's oddly colored, it's it's always kind of disturbing. It's that orangish reddish. Hey, it's what's like wrong with orangish it. reddish? <laughs> Nothing if you're Ronald McDonald, but hey now. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, all right, slow it down. Let's let's yeah, right. We got to start slow and taper off from there. Well, let's get back to shenanigans. <laughs> he threw me over the top rope, DQ him. <laughs> <laughs> James Beard's like, I actually saw that one, buddy. I yeah. can't exactly. And of course, Craig John, that's not even a rule here in the Global Wrestling Federation. <laughs> Have you read James Beard's book? I haven't. I need to. Yeah. Um, I've read a lot of good stuff he's written online over the years and everything. And you always know he's an authority in the ring because he has the biggest freaking patch of anybody on his referee shirts at all times. <laughs> oh. Another thing I love about Buddy is like he just lays in the simplest stuff, but he always makes it look like he's killing people. Yeah. That and how has no one ever stolen that corkscrew elbow drop? I know, all these years later, and nobody has stolen it. You think somebody would. Right? It looks spectacular. I don't, think anybody, I don't know that anybody really could apply it quite like he did, though. That's true, but I'm just surprised no one's even tried. Yeah. Not on television, anyway, where we could see right. it. And Buddy hooks the cravat, which not normal to see back in 91. <laughs> Young Chris Hero must have been watching. So on an upcoming episode of Dangerous Conversations, we're going to be talking about the Memphis Mafia, which of course is Doug Gilbert, Eddie Gilbert, Tommy Rich, Brian Christopher, and Buddy Landale. So I'm looking forward to hearing some of Doug and Tommy's stories about Buddy. Dear Lord, what a group. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Love this spot too. Yes. Don't let him hit me. Take him down by the hair. <laughs> <laughs> Just classic heel stuff. I mean, right? And like I said, it's it's all so simple, and the crowd is eating it up. And I'm not like I'm not an anti like what the guys are doing today. Like I don't watch a ton of it, but you know, if it gets over, it gets over. But like, yeah, these guys don't even have to. I mean, I guess they're leaving their feet, but you know, none of these bumps are killing a guy. And none of these bumps. It's just so simple and. Like I said, the fans are eating this shit up. And I still think, I mean, maybe not these exact spots, but this thing, the stuff can still get over today. Well, because even then, a whole show of this wouldn't have worked. But, you know, for this particular match, it's perfect. It gets the fans going. And I think now, if you had somebody that could do this kind of thing and do it well, it'd still get over just as well because it would stand out as being so different from everything else on the show. Exactly. You know? Exactly. That's why I think, I mean, it's in a completely different vein and not to go. Completely, that's why I think like for a while there, when guys like Timothy Thatcher and Saber and Gulak and all those guys were doing like the, the British spots and stuff like that in the middle of like the high spot shows, that's why I think they were so unique and that was getting over there for a while. Like, cause yeah, it was just, they were slowing things down and doing completely different stuff. And not that that's the same as this, but you know what I mean? Well, and honestly, in the beginning, when he was going out of his way, trying to be such a heel, old school heel. I really hoped that MJF was going to be more of a buddy Landale kind of heel and do this kind of cheap heat, you know, just straight up heel stuff and not veer off into, what he became and I don't, I don't think there's any coming back from that now no. but I think if he'd have kept it simple and played to his strengths and done these kind of cheap ass things and it would make him a bigger heel because when you're on a show full of high flyers and all this crazy stuff and then he's doing stuff like this it would stand out even more and there we get the victory with the foot on the rope. Immediately with the foot on the ropes I love it and no I agree with what you're saying 100% but now he's just all about the you know using the swearing and shitting on the football teams and yeah, yeah, which i yeah. think is like that's fine for once in a while cheap heat but not every freaking time you're out there cheap heat so 
Exactly. But anyway, back to global. Yeah, no, like I said, that match is so simple and it's just such a, you know, and it's not something Buddy couldn't do that match every week, but for no. a first round of a tournament to come out there and just completely bullshit cheat your way through, beautiful. And, and I think to your point, a guy like Gary Young, who is synonymous with being a heel around there, it, if, if somebody maybe was checking back in, they hadn't seen Global or you know, they hadn't seen Global or they hadn't been around Texas in a while, it really spelled it out who was the heel, who was the baby face. There was no exactly. question that Buddy's the bad guy and poor Gary's getting the shaft. And so uh, just, yeah, when you first sent me that match a couple of years ago, um, and I sat and watched it, and I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, yes, that's so awesome because Buddy's using all this old school, like, Tennessee uh, spot show stuff, but he's using right. it on TV, and it's brand new. But the thing that, that stood out to me even more so, because I kind of just watched that one match, but watching this whole episode in succession like that, it's like nothing else on this show came close to getting the kind of reaction. Those crowd, oh, that no. crowd was into that match the whole time, and everything he did, they were on their feet and, oh, cheating he's cheating and you know that's so even, uh, not to, if, you, if you look at the the whole taping because i think they tape most of the first round of the tournament in the same night if you even look at like everything they did like still nothing looked like that i mean because yeah. like i mean like patriot and stan lane was about the only other good match in the first round and nothing else had that kind of i mean i'm sure there was some you know like eye pokes and cheap shit here and there nothing had that level of so it, it completely stood out on its own Absolutely. because there were there were other power matches and other you know this bullshit and that bullshit but that match was perfect for what it was and because i mean and not to spoil in case we do it again but buddy ends up going to the finals of the tournament and just working that way throughout makes him the perfect foil for the patriot at the end Oh, exactly. Because, you know, and, you know, the, the global did some things well and they did some things poorly. But one of the one of the best things they did was the Patriot character and the fact that, you know, you know, the Patriot would, you know, I don't want to win a match this way. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to cheat victory. And, I, and so, like you say, you've built Buddy up as just the ultimate low down rule breaker. He's <laughs> and then Patriots, the upstanding patriotic right. citizen who's going to do the right thing. I mean, well, it's that's, a match made in heaven, you know. And the interesting, like, Global's tournaments were set up weird so that the final round came down to three people. And it yeah. comes down to the Patriot, Chris Walker, and like I said, because I don't know that we'll come back to the TV title tournament. It comes down to Patriot, Chris Walker, and Buddy. And they do a coin flip. So, of course, Patriot and Chris Walker wrestle first. So Buddy comes in fresh as a daisy. And then, of course, immediately starts cheating. So Patriot has to fight back the ultimate odds to win, and like it's the perfect ending to the tournament. So like I, that's a booking job well done there. And I again another thing I think is missing from modern wrestling. But yeah, they built the Patriot the character really well. I liked them, and not just because that you know I do a podcast and have gotten to be friends with him. Uh, I like the dark Patriot being the antithesis of, of the Patriot and uh, the way they, they worked that. I liked it when Bruce became his manager. Um, I, I thought he was, you know, a good despicable heel manager. And uh, they were, I thought him and Doug paired well together. There was a lot of weirdness, like you said, though, with like Patriot coming and going and, you know, he had to leave and go to, you know, Dark Patriot won the title initially because Del Wilkes had to go to Japan. So they had to get the belt off of him and get him out of there for a little bit. But uh, they worked around all that stuff as best they could. And uh, that's one of the things I thought they did well. Now, there's plenty of other stuff you could sit and pick apart and be like, oh, right. Yes, but they did that well. Like I said, there was uh, every day it was fun to come home and see just who was going to pop up on my television. Oh, yeah. EWF ring. And uh, some guys who went on to be huge stars passed through there. You know, some guys that uh, had already been huge stars and was kind of on their on their way on the downward slide of their career. And um, I'll always remember, you know, seeing like the Lightning Kid and Jerry Lynn and some of those guys there, and then to see what they went on to become. Um, just, just I don't know. It's it's a cool spot in history. I, like I say, I've tried watching large doses of it and you know I, I can't sit and watch a, a bunch of it you know it's it's it wears it wears thin after a little bit but um, right 
places. And there's enough good stuff that I think that uh, we circle back to it from time to time and cherry pick certain episodes here and there. There's some good stuff to maybe say maybe next time we'll circle back to some with some Black Bart and some John Tatum just for some real down home Texas vibes. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, Anytime we can get us a good old dad gum Black Bart promo. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, whether it's whether it's global or maybe we uh, maybe for, you know, maybe even some Patreon or something, we may dip back into some Mid-South. But I'd like to see some John Tatum and Jack Victory. Absolutely. At some point. Um, and that's just kind of what these shows are, folks. It's just uh, me and my friends going back, watching shows that that, you know, we enjoy or uh, stuff we want to go back and have an excuse to go back and relive and then get on here and talk about it. sometimes. I kind of like this this format. We, we've been kind of doing this more on the USWA one as well, where we review most of the show, then we'll pick one match that we'll watch rather than just watching and talking over the whole show. So, you know, if there's a match on there that we want to watch, just like you do, did Buddy and Gary Young there, that may be how we do these in the future. So, and if you're watching this, if you're enjoying it, if you're liking the reviews, and I have been getting a lot of good feedback from, uh, we got a lot of regular listeners that, that follow the USWA episodes every week and they, they message me and they tell me what they like and uh, you know, what they're looking forward to coming up. Oh, wait till we get to this week when so-and-so is there. So if there's something that you would like to see us watch and review in the future, uh, if it's something I don't think Bob's going to want to watch, I've got a few <laughs> other uh, friends that are willing to, uh, to tag in and do these as well. So um Please suggest anything uh, you want, and I can't promise we can do all of them, but if I have access to it and it's not something that's going to get us kicked off YouTube, we'll do it. And there's a few things that we want to do that probably would get us kicked off YouTube, so we're going to do them on Patreon. So uh, there's a lot of cool stuff over on the... Battle Bowl! (laughs) Yes, Bob wants to do WCW Battle Bowl, which I'm pretty convinced is his way of paying me back in one fell swoop for the whole UWF thing. And so... uh, I feel like I owe that to him, so we're going to do that. <laughs> um, you know you want to see Bill Kazmaier team with Jushin Liger. <laughs> where else are you going to see it? That's for sure. Holy. Um, but yeah, the, over at the uh, uh, Retro Wrestling, uh, uh, patreon.com slash retro wrestling archive, we got some really cool stuff there. It's just $5 a month, some matches that I can't put on YouTube. It would get me in trouble, uh, Some especially some cool matches from Japan and different places and there may even be some wrestling movies and documentaries on there and some things I can't tell you. Uh, so check it out. There's going to be a lot more stuff like this. Um, this is free. This is for free on the YouTube channel. But like I say, we're going to do some watch along stuff for Patreon. Me and Brian Trammell did some that's, that's maybe up by the time you see this and uh, me and Bob's going to watch Battle Bowl. Who knows what other all oh, shows that uh, we've talked about over the years that uh, we've never got a chance to sit and watch together. And it's not like just if, you, if you're not familiar with the watch along format, it's not like we're doing play by play over an old show. It's it's basically just a backdrop for us to have discussions about about the show and the people on the show. And that usually leads into, you know, well, you remember when they were there? And oh, did you ever hear this story about so and so? And so a lot of other stuff comes to light so it's not like you just hear it's not like we're playing tony shivani and jesse ventura over battle bowl whoever did comment that's probably not who did commentary on that show but you get what i'm saying Mm -hmm. um so anyway check out the patreon there's a lot of cool stuff and i'm adding stuff all the time uh old stuff you're not going to find anything newer than the 90s on there i don't i don't really care about anything past about 1996 is my limit these days. So um, check it out. You watch Joshi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna kind of go outside the realm of our our scope of retro and watch some Joshi wrestling just for Bob. Uh, oh, I'm just making you watch it because I know you don't like it. Because uh, <laughs> I'm just I, I'm just willing to watch it just to show you that I'm willing to watch it, and then afterwards I can tell you like, <laughs> yeah, why the fuck do you watch this stuff like? You don't want to just look at chicks. There's other things that have been watching <laughs> Japanese wrestling. But <coughs> I guess the wives aren't as forgiving if if you can bill it as wrestling. Mm. You know. Why do you watch that wrestling without your pants on, Bob? But anyway. Uh I guess I that's was... uh, I guess that's got global covered for uh 
July 10th, 1991. Is there any, is there anything else you want to put on as a kind of a bow to wrap this one up? Can't think of anything else. Like I said, I, I really like the main event of that show. I think global is a fun callback. Uh, it was definitely a interesting concept that probably didn't pan out like it should have. Um, you know, the Nigerian royalty turned out not to be real. Who'd have thunk it? So, and Nigerian uh, royalty, they never come through for you. They, they have so many, they come through with all those promises, but they, yeah. they never deliver. Please ignore the fact that we cannot spell Nigerian or royalty. So, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, they're like Chris Walker. There's so much potential there. Right. It just never pans exactly. out. Exactly. <laughs> Bless their heart. Uh, so we're going to try to have Bob on at least about maybe once a month to do in these things, maybe more if we can twist his arm, but he's a busy man. So if we can get him on here once a month, we're going to call it a win. Any idea what you think you might want to watch the next time? We're not going to hold you to it, but just is there anything rattling around in the back of your mind that you're going, you know what, that'd be fun for us to cover. Um, other than the show we want to do for Patreon, uh, maybe we'll give the AWF a try. Watch some round system at play. So. It's true. Uh, my my friend Tommy Rich is on there, and uh, the Freebirds at the tail, tail, tail end of their career are on there some, and Greg Hammer Valentine. Tony Atlas is on there. And oh! Thank God Pat Patterson's <laughs> out there grabbing his Becca. But he does have to use a cellophone. But anyway. Uh, yeah, AWF's interesting. We may have to do that. The Sergeant Slaughter and Tito Santana and Ken Resnick and they had a lot of stars. Give them they that. They did. They had a lot of stars, but <laughs> just not a lot of good ideas. <laughs> we did a lot of other promoters that just couldn't figure out what to do with them. But anyway, thank y'all for joining us for this review of the Global Wrestling Federation from 1991. Like I say, we'll definitely revisit it in the future. I even want to, at some point, kind of dip towards the end and see some maybe some ebony experience matches mm. rod price and tugboat knows, we taylor may, we may see tugboat taylor we may watch a bungee jump match or <laughs> maniac mike davis mm. as Rob see as the moon broadcast bob has flashbacks of uwf mm. in his head and also while broadcast bob is here i feel like this is as good a time as any remind folks Right here on the channel, here on YouTube, go back and check out OWF Worldwide Wrestling. It's a fun show. It's 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 comedy. It's parody. It's it's bad wrestling with fun commentary. Broadcast Bob's on there. I was on there towards the end. There's some goof named Whitey Jenkins that's on there through most of it. But it's a good time, and uh, we spent about a year doing it. And there's there's 52 episodes to prove it. And uh, we, we hope you check it out. Like I say, it's right here on this very channel. All you got to do is search OWF Worldwide, and it'll pull up. And The just, first uh, few episodes are a little rough, but we promise you it gets funnier. There's there's old school commercials every week. Yes. Um, we tried. We yes, tried. some commercials paid off the whole episode, even if you didn't like the wrestling. Oh, the, the wrestling, the, the the wrestling sucks. Was... We'll tell you that up front, but we, we did our best to make it funny. And I think we succeeded most of the time. And, and and we usually did really well around the holidays. Some of our holiday specials are usually pretty fun. Oh, uh, yes. Specialty gimmick matches. and The 4th of, of July episode was brilliant. 4th of July episode may be our... Uh, masterpiece. Masterpiece. I, I refuse to say chef's kiss because I want to murder people <laughs> that, that use that term. And you know that very well. But uh, Defiantly. Defiantly. Wham! We are done, folks. So... Thank you for checking this out. We will see you again real soon. Next week, as a matter of fact, for more Retro Wrestling with Gene J. Hi, this is Mike Needham, host of the Reckless Abandon Podcast with Mike Needham. We invite you to jump on your favorite podcast platform and search for the Reckless Abandon Podcast and give us a listen. 
I'm sometimes joined by part-time podcaster, part-time co-host, and full-time wife, Tiffany Nicole. And when you get the wife on there, sometimes that can lead to some very interesting conversation. We talk wrestling, we talk pop culture, we talk local events in West Tennessee, local happenings in West Tennessee, and a ton of other stuff. I would like to tell you that this is a show about nothing, but Seinfeld already has that copyrighted, so I cannot tell you that our podcast is a show about nothing. But be sure to check out the Reckless Abandon podcast. Find us on Facebook. Also, look up the Microgroup Podcasting family on Facebook and see some of our other podcasts we have out there. Until next time, make good choices, and always remember, no dollar, no dice. This is Wrestling Nostalgia, the podcast that dives into wrestling history. Hey, wrestling fans, I'm Dave Dynasty. And if you enjoy podcasts that are knowledgeable and history-driven, then Wrestling Nostalgia is for you. With great guests and fun interviews, there are over 200 episodes in our archives. We chat with several first-time guests and often cover topics not discussed on other podcasts. Look up Wrestling Nostalgia on your favorite podcast platform and visit all of our links at linktree slash rasslepod. That is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash R-A-S-S-L-E-P-O-D. And remember, wherever you go, whatever you do, be good, be safe, and keep on growing.